I'm going to tell you something really strange. The Vikings are one of the reasons why the Crusades happened. So the Vikings were Germans. They were the Germans who settled Scandinavia. Scandinavia was kind of like the worst piece of real estate in Europe at the time. The people who became the Vikings, they never called themselves Viking. Viking is a term we've retroactively put on top of them. The Vikings, I'm going to use the term Viking anyway though. The Vikings got stuck with this piece of real estate where you really couldn't grow a crop. So pretty much all you could do was raise cattle and go fishing. And at some point, their population had reached a threshold. They had sort of reached the carrying capacity of cheese rolls and dried fish. And when that happened, they had no choice but to start looking for alternatives. And they, they took two approaches, by the way. One approach the Vikings did was they set out to start trading. They thought, you know what, we can fix our problem if we can do trade because we'll have the money to buy the food that we need. And, and the Eastern Vikings, the Swedes, got so into this, they actually started trying to figure out where they could go to, and they started reading their sagas. This is the 8th century. They're not reading their sagas, they were oral histories. They were listening to their sagas. And, and the sagas told the Vikings that the place the Germans were from was Iran. So the sagas tell the Vikings, you're originally from Persia, so the Swedes go, wow, that's, a, that's an idea, let's go, let's see what we can find. And so what they would do is they would go to what is today Latvia, they would take their long ships up the Divina River, they'd go as far inland as you could get, pretty close to the city of Rejev, they would pull their ships out of the water, fully loaded, because they have to carry their supplies, they can't leave the supplies behind. So, so they would carry these fully loaded ships over land until they got to the Volga River, I mean, that's a pretty manly, you know what I mean? Like, oh, they've got their armor and their weapons and they're hauling these. I, uh, I, I want to go backwards in time just to see this. That, you know there was a lot of grunting. And then they put the ship in the Volga River and they sailed the Volga River all the way to the Caspian Sea and they went down the Caspian Sea to the Persian coast. And they're like, hi. And the Arabs had just conquered Persia a couple of centuries earlier. And they began trading. Now, to supplement their trading on that long trade route, they would also raid. And they would attack the Slavic populations along the way, and they would take some for slaves, and then they would sell them into the slave markets, make a little bit of extra coin. The Western Vikings started raiding England. And then they started expanding where they raided, and before you knew it, they were just raiding all of Northern and Western Europe. And in the process, they start to get some amazing victories. The Vikings actually end up conquering places like England. They get multiple kings of England. Knut the Great, of course, the most famous, but there's also Svein Forkbeard. Isn't that a cool name? Svein Forkbeard. And they end up ruling this empire that stretches across Scandinavia and England. And they were doing all right for themselves. And they got their eyes on Paris. And they thought, you know what, let's go take France. I mean, why not? We've got Latvia and Estonia and Finland and Ukraine, right? Because Ukrainian nobles couldn't figure out how to rule their lands, so they started hiring Viking mercenaries. The, the group of Viking mercenaries they hired were the Rus, R-U-S. And the Rus eventually created Kievan Rus because they realized they were the only armed guys and they didn't know why they were taking orders from anybody. And they just took over and that's how Russia was founded. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, they almost got Paris. Long story short, they were on the island. They were battering down doors. They were scaling the walls. They almost got Paris. It was so close. And so after they failed to get Paris, the French came out and they went, okay, <laughs> that was too close. You almost got us. We don't think there, if you get a second shot, we don't think we're making it. So what do we do? We, we, we're, we're not surrendering, surrendering. We're not giving you Paris. We're going to make you fight for it if you try to get it again. But we really don't want you to try again. We're going we're gonna to meet you somewhere. And they make a deal with a guy named Rollo. And the deal is Northern France. They give Rollo northern France. Now, the Vikings, I told you, weren't called Vikings. They were called the Northmen, or 
depending on your language, Norsemen or Nordmen or Normans. And so the Vikings named northern France after themselves. They called it Normandy. And they began ruling it, but they had a problem. And that was that the French peasants wouldn't learn German. They wouldn't learn to speak the dialects of German that the Vikings were speaking. They, would, they kept insisting on speaking French. And so the Norman nobility, Rollo, by the way, got Normandy in 911. The Norman nobility now has to learn French so that when they're abusing their peasants, the peasants understand the abuse, right? You, it doesn't help to shout at some, a peasant and then they don't understand you. You need them to understand, so they learn French. And what that does then is it sets us up for a really strange set of events. Somebody gets a great idea just a few decades later, 999, so 911 to 999, so 88 years later, to hire Norman mercenaries in southern Italy. And so Norman mercenaries start to travel from northern France all the way to southern Italy, and they're being used by everybody. What eventually happens is those Normans go, why are we fighting for these other guys? And in 1030, the first Norman gets made a lord in southern Italy, and he slowly starts to conquer. And subsequent generations of Normans start to take pieces of southern Italy. And in 1061, the Normans are getting on ships and they're crossing over to Sicily and they begin conquering Sicily. Sicily had been conquered by the Arabs two centuries earlier. In 1084, the Pope asks for an army to attack Spain. Spain was at that time majority controlled by Muslims. The furthest north city that the Muslims owned in 1084 was a city called Barbastro. And so the Pope asks for a Christian army to go to Barbastro and take it. One quarter of that army was a group of Normans. When they capture the city, at first they're pillaging it, they're slaughtering people, but the Normans decide they like the place and they stay and the majority of the population is still Arab and it's still Muslim. And the Normans who stay start dressing like the Arabs and they learn Arabic and they're really digging Arab society and they, they go Indian, right? They go native. And it, and it shocks everybody because it's like, wait, these French speaking blue eyed blonde Vikings are in Spain learning Muslim culture. And in a way, when you think about it, all three of these events that I just described are like little precursor crusades. The real crusader army is a mixture of nobles from across France and Germany primarily, but also Italy because there's Normans coming. The crusaders you need to know about are Bohemond of, of Toronto, not Canada, but Italy. His nephew, Tancred, Godfrey de Bouillon and Baldwin de Bologna. Baldwin and Godfrey are both from northern France. They weren't actually Normans, but they had definitely sided with the Normans. Um, their father, Eustace II, in fact, was with William the Conqueror in 1066 when the Normans decided to also conquer England. The Normans were very busy people. Right, oh, let's go to Spain. You know what? I Southern Italy, Anatolia, England. In other words, long after the Vikings started speaking French, they're still tearing up the planet. They're on this like permanent multi-century rampage. And it wasn't enough for them that they had captured England already twice. They wanted it a third time. They're like, this it was good real estate. We want it back. And they've got it. And so when Godfrey and Baldwin go on this crusade, they're not actually Normans, but they're part of the Norman sphere. So in a way, the, the, the top four of the five most important crusaders are Normans. The fifth guy is a guy named Raymond. Uh, he's Raymond of Toulouse, also known as Raymond Saint-Gilles. Um, he was Raymond IV of Toulouse. They show up at Constantinople and they swear an oath of fealty. Well, not Tancred, he refuses. He wants nothing to do with this. 
And what they promise is that all the land they capture will be handed to Alexius Comnenus, the Roman emperor. And of course, they're lying through their teeth. They have no intention whatsoever of handing anything over. Their, their goal is to go in there, carve off land, and make their own little personal fiefdoms. 